that was me. <laughs> Thank you. So the good news for all of you is that I'm not going to sing. I'm sure you're relieved to hear that. <laughs> so as you might have guessed, I'm a former professional bike racer. Um, I was a professional cyclist for about 20 years. And I may take on a new challenge this year. I've actually already decided that I'm going to try and break three hours in a marathon sometime in April. We'll just see how our, our legs get on uh, hitting the cement instead of turning in circles. Um, for now, actually, I still do race my bike a little bit. I race mostly with the men in France because the competitions with the men are a little bit tougher, and I like it when they're tough. And what I enjoy the most about racing with the men in France is when they see a chick coming to the start line, I can see them rubbing their hands together and going, yes, there's a woman in the race today, I won't be dead last. <laughs> but little do these men know what these legs have done prior to getting to this bike race. So I don't say anything, I just let my legs do the talking. Question is, how did my bike and I get introduced to each other? Well, I'll back up a little bit. My parents are French, and they moved to Chicago. My father was a professor of sociology at the University of Northwestern. So I was born and raised in Chicago. And when I was about 14 or 15, we moved from Chicago to Maryland. And for some unknown reason, at the age of 22, I um, started having an adventure with uh, epilepsy. What happened prior to that, I was uh, at the University of Maryland studying, and in order to pay for my studies, I decided I would spend the summer working as a bike messenger. So in order to do that, I had to buy myself a bike. And being on the usual college student budget, I um, managed to scrape up $150. And I, bought, I found a bike in the want ads. I bought a big green hunk of junk uh, bicycle from a policeman in Washington. And it really was big. If any of you know anything about bikes, I usually ride a 51. And this was a 57, so it was quite a, a, big, uh, a big horse. <laughs> anyway, so I took my bike to the streets and I'm pedaling around DC delivering documents to senators, congressmen, lawyers, and running in and out of buildings all day. And this particular summer that I was working, it was brutally hot. And um, I just remember, you know, kind of going into these buildings and getting hit by the air conditioning and then going back outside and it was 100 plus degrees. And um, sometime during, <laughs> My first week, I got a flat tire, as you do when you're riding around the streets of Washington, and pulled into a bike shop to buy myself an inner tube. And um, I walked up to the cashier to pay for my inner tube, and that's when my life changed. I'm told that my back arched, I screamed, and the inner tube that I was holding went flying through the air and crashed down, hitting the cement floor with me going down after it. And lucky for me, the man standing next to me in the line, for some reason, sensed something wasn't quite right and put his arms out to catch me and accompanied me to the ground, keeping me from cracking my head open as I hit the cement floor. Still managed to bite my tongue quite hard. And then I remember just laying in my, on my back and looking up at this semicircle of faces looking down at me. And somebody leaned in and said, do you have epilepsy? And I just remember thinking, God, what an odd question. And what is epilepsy? And why are all these people staring at me? And then somebody else said, well, do you know your name? Well, probably should, but no name comes to mind, you know? It's one of those things on the tip of your tongue that you'd really like to share this information with them, but you just can't. And then somebody else asked me if I could tell them where I lived. No. <laughs> no idea, you know, it's just, it's going to come to me, if you give me a few minutes, it'll come, and I could see these people were getting a little impatient, and I'm sure the bike shop wanted to get back to their regular business, and then somebody asked me, well, can you tell us who the president is of the United States of America, and before I could keep the answer from blurting out, I just said, Nixon, yes, it's Nixon, and I was so happy I got an answer out, and Nixon had been impeached years before, it was Reagan at the time, <laughs> So they said, well, miss, we're going to load you up onto the stretcher and take you for a free ride to the Washington Hospital Center. <laughs> so off I went, sirens blaring, me in tow. And I spent, oh, I'd spent about 48 hours in the neurological unit of the Washington Hospital Center where I was poked and prodded, had MRIs and EEGs and a blood test and x-rays and all kinds of tests. And um, uh, so two days later, the neurologist walked into my room and said, well, you have epilepsy. Your driver's license will be suspended immediately, effective now, for one year. 
Um, you shouldn't go out alone. You shouldn't to ride your bike or swim or play or do this or do that. And above all, you shouldn't tell anybody that you have epilepsy. You shouldn't tell your employers. You shouldn't tell your friends. You, and this lady's going on and on. And I'm just thinking, who is this lady walking into my room and telling me that I can't live 300% the way I always have? It's like she was telling me the Marian I was yesterday is not the Marian I am today. So all along, you know, the, uh, all the while that she's telling me all this, I'm thinking to myself, well, I've always been a little bit rebellious, and I'm sure I inherited that trait from my dearest father and his character as well. And I just thought, well, I think I'm going to do just the opposite of what she says. I'm going to be very upfront about my epilepsy, and if people can't deal with it, then it's their problem and not mine. So, <laughs> thank you. So soon afterwards, I found myself um, uh, with uh, the, the uh, sorry, <laughs> come back to myself. Um, I had a, I'd just gotten a job to change from working as a courier. I decided to work as a strength and conditioning coach about, uh, it was about 30 kilometers from my house. So I found myself riding my bike to work and back 60 kilometers a day. Um, buses for me were not an option. They're never on time and I just find them unreliable and it was something that would have made me feel dependent, and I really don't like feeling dependent. So the good thing about the bike was that it gave me this sense of freedom and independence as well. So here I am riding my work, bike to work and back, 60 kilometers a day, and I remember um, about two months into this, a guy I worked with named Steve asked me, do you ride, do you race? I mean, do you ride a lot, or are you getting ready for something, a triathlon or something? I said, no, no, just riding to work and back and timing myself from time to time and it, I'm getting a little bit faster on the way there. The way back is more uphill, so it's, it takes a little bit longer. And this guy, Steve, said to me, well, there's a bike race on on Sunday. Why don't you come out and give it a try? And I'm thinking, well, okay, I've never ridden in a Peloton before, but I'll try anything once, so why not? So I meet him at the uh, start of the race on Sunday. It's a criterium, which means you do about 40 or 50 laps around the same uh, mile and a half circuit with a little hill and a, a little turn. And um, so I get there with my hunk of junk, a green machine, my big dirty green bike, my Lycra shorts with underwear on underneath, which you do not do in bike racing, um, bright orange wool socks, tennis shoes. I didn't have the proper cycling shoes and a ratty t-shirt with the sleeves cut off and my braids kind of uneven, my helmet on a little sideways. So I get to the front of the starting line and I'm looking to the right and to the left of me. And these women are all geared up in lycra skin suits with their sponsors flashed all over them, all on custom-made bikes, and they're all looking me up and down going, what, what is this? Is this a joke? And I'm starting to think, oh goodness, I have never ridden in a peloton before, I've never even ridden next to anyone before, so I basically have two choices here. I can either ride off the front or off the back, so we'll just try and make it to the front and stay there, and if, if I get too nervous and I don't know, if I get overtaken by the peloton then I'll just pull over and try not to bring anyone down with me. So all of a sudden the speaker said three, two, one, shot the gun and we were off. And I put it in the biggest gear I had and just took off. And I stayed at the front of the, the peloton for the entire race and every time I kept coming through the start finish area I could hear my friend Steve screaming at me, Marion, draft, get some cover, get some cover. And I'm looking up at this guy going, get some cover. It's nice out. What's he talking about? There's nothing falling out of the sky. And then he's telling me to grab a wheel. So I'm starting to look over on the side of the road, thinking, a oh, wheel, is, are there spare wheels? Do, do I need to get another wheel? I mean, I've got two. Isn't that enough? And I took my training wheels off a long time ago. So, so I really had no idea. I mean, he was telling me, trying to enlighten me to a few uh, tactical issues that would be important later on. But anyway, 200 meters from the finish line, I'm still at the front, and then last turn, three girls came around me and took first, second, and third, and I came in fourth, but I was elated. I was just, I was so happy because this was something, it was my first time out, it was something I was giving a shot at, and I knew I was strong. I just had some things that I needed to work, in on, work on and develop, and this was something I could do. So I decided I would take it a few steps further and then from there just see how far I really could take it. So I went to talk to the winner and congr congratulate her and the, when I asked her for a few tips, the first thing she said to me was to not wear underwear under my chamois because it wasn't attractive and it probably wasn't good for me either. So, and to buy the proper equipment. 
From there on, I was able to find a local bike club, um, a lot of guys to train with who sort of became my mentors and my coaches and um, told me what getting a wheel meant and taught me about drafting when you ride next to someone and they end up breaking the wind for you, making it easier for you to ride along, getting cover, not dodging snowflakes or raindrops or anything. And I worked my way on, within the next three years, I just worked my way up, level through level, race by race, and worked my way on to the U.S. national team. I spent one summer racing with them in Europe. We raced in Norway, did quite well. And over that particular summer, I had been to a training camp at the U.S. Olympic Training Center. I had won about 20 races and raced in the Tour of Idaho, which was a big event for women at the time and really done well, and I'd spoken to the national coach several times about um, maybe getting on the U.S. team for the World Championships that were going to be held in Ghent, Belgium that summer. So he tells me what races I need to really focus on, what races I need to win to qualify for the Worlds, and national championships were one of the biggest races that I needed to do well at. So we get to nationals. I win the in, uh, the team time trial with my team, take a second in the, in, on the, in the road race and take a third in the individual time trial. So with three medals, I mean, I figured I was pretty much a shoe in for the U.S. team. After the event, the coach called all the athletes into a little room and started calling off the people who were going to be representing the U.S. at the World Championships. And Every athlete in that room pretty much assumed because of the season I had had up to that point that I was a shoe-in on the team. And I pretty much thought so too. So the coach went down all these names and um, uh, got to this third to last name and I wasn't there and the second to last name and I still wasn't there and the last name and guess what? <laughs> I still wasn't there. So when he was all said and done, everybody sort of looked around and a friend of mine gave me one of these little expressions like, why don't you go and talk to him? So I went over and I said, uh, excuse me, did you by any chance forget someone's name on that list? And he couldn't even look me in the eye. He just sort of looked down and kicked at the ground and said, oh, geez, you know, um, your name did come up and we did discuss it, but you have epilepsy and that makes you a risk to the team. My first reaction was really to headbutt him, just to, <laughs> <laughs> to one of those. But I was diplomatic. I withheld myself and I said, okay, well, my brain started uh, working on time for once, and I was thinking, well, I did race with some French girls this summer, and they told me I was welcome to come and ride on their club team in Brittany over the end of the summer if I wanted to. And because I have dual, dual citizenship, I could always try and race for France. So I went to the payphone. There weren't cell phones at that time. We are talking a few years ago. And um, within 20 minutes, I had it all, all sorted, got a plane ticket, flew to France, raced the rest of the summer there, and the French team offered me a spot on the national team. I told them I wanted to ride the World Championships, the Olympics, and that I had epilepsy. And if it was a problem for them, it wasn't a problem for me. So that following year, for the first time ever, and the only time ever, the French national women's team won the team time trial at the World Championships. And the United States was not on the podium. Sorry about that. But <laughs> the... <laughs> Ironically, the first person to shake my hand as I was stepping down from the podium was the same U.S. coach who kind of took credit, actually, for my success, saying, you know, if I had bought you on the team, you might not have been as strong as you are now because I bet that every pedal stroke you were thinking, I'll show them, I'll show them, I'll show them. And, you know, I have to give him credit for that. He's, I'm not angry with him. I think there is some... He, he does have a little bit of... A, of reason to, to believe in himself on that. But anyway, um, time, uh, you know, time went on and uh, my bike and I got along so well that we went on to win six world titles, uh, ten French championships, break a world record, and win two Olympic silvers. And thank you. <laughs> I'm not telling you all of this to to just to tell you what I've done, but to tell you that I've done it with epilepsy. So the, the main thing, or the, the main uh, um, uh, statement I guess I want to make is that I have epilepsy, but epilepsy doesn't have me. So I've, it's, 
It's been a process. It's never been easy, and there have been obstacles. One of the bis biggest obstacles was finding a treatment that was right for me. The very first treatment I took was probably one of the oldest molecules around, and I slept 19 hours a day, and I just I couldn't get out of my own way. I lost 11 kilos, and I begged my doctor after a month to take me off of it and to find something different. And just during that time period, there were some new molecules just coming out. So after arguing with her for six months, she finally agreed to try, have me try something else. And the next medication I tried was a little bit better, but I think it took me at least 12 years to really dial it in and get it right. And the fact that I had epilepsy and that I was competing probably made me push myself a little bit harder. And e today I can still say honestly that I'm not convinced I would have been world and Olympic champion had I not had epilepsy. Because the fact that I had epilepsy and that I was under medication that definitely was not a sports enhancing product made me push myself a little bit harder. I always felt like if I was tired from a seizure or from the medication that it, I couldn't use that as an excuse not to go out and train because someone else was out there training if I wasn't. So I tended to push myself a little bit harder which ended up making me a little bit stronger or at least at the same level as my competitors. And all of this to say again that there are obstacles but if you keep working at it with your neurologist, you can usually find the right treatment that's right for you. And because we are all different, it is really important that you keep an open dialogue going with your neurologist. The main thing that's really helped me in, uh, in my quest to become a top-level athlete with epilepsy is pretty much drawing a parallel to racing my bike or to racing, now I'm trying to to race uh, my next marathon. I have done some triathlons too, but honestly I swim like a dead cow, so it's really not fun racing <laughs> triathlons. <laughs> I did five of them last year and I was able to win four of them because on the bike and the run I'm able to catch up, but uh, just the swim is horrifying. And, um, and I end up swallowing like half the ocean or the lake or whatever it is we're swimming through, so that's no fun either. But the three tactics that have really helped me as a, an athlete or a person with epilepsy are, for one, finding a good teammate. And a good teammate can be the Epilepsy Foundation of Michigan, the person you want to call when you've got, just gotten diagnosed to know how to deal with your epilepsy. It can be a neurologist, one that you know you feel comfortable with. I went through a few neurologists as well because it was important to me to know the neurologist was going to listen and, and react to the fact that I was having side effects that weren't going to help me while I was training and that I wanted somebody who was really my teammate on my side and who was going to help me get over this obstacle and, and really do what it took to help me win. The second is to have a plan of attack. How do you live with epilepsy? Well, I couldn't drive so I rode my bike and if your epilepsy is really severe and you can't ride a bike then you have to find another way around that. There's, uh, you know, the, the buses which aren't my favorite mode of transportation but they exist and they're there for a reason so you can use the buses. Um, and the third is to know your opponent. Your opponent being the epilepsy or the medications you have to take and just knowing everything you can about them. It's important to know what side effects may be caused by a certain treatment, to know if that's what's causing you to, to be a little bit down and then to be able to pick yourself up again and say, oh, okay, that must be from the medication, so we'll just push onward and, and push a little bit further and, and be a little stronger. Um, one thing that I really would like to leave you with as a thought to ponder on is that I strongly believe that everyone living with epilepsy, and even those who don't live with epilepsy, need to know that if they believe they can do something, all of you, I mean, where there's a will, there's a way. If you believe you can do it, you can. There, it, you, it, you're wasting your time if you ponder on why you can't. Just think about how you can. And every single one of you is a potential gold medalist, whether it's in sports, f finishing university, or getting to university, or finding a job. So if there's any way myself or the Epilepsy of Michigan can help you find that gold medal, then ask any questions you'd like to ask. I'm here to answer them. And I'm also selling a book that I wrote called Tenacious. It's on one of these tables over here, so I'd be happy to sign a book for you. The proceeds from the book, part of them will go to the Epilepsy Foundation of Michigan, and the other part will go to helping me pay back what it took to get them here, because DHL is not free. And, um, um, 
if you have any questions, please ask. I'd really, I'm here to, to help and do whatever I can to bring out your gold medals and help you put them around your neck. Thank you.